Recent Sony cameras offer a myriad of functions and almost infinite customization options, and the a7 III is no exception. Newcomers tend to be overwhelmed by the functions and options overdose and don't know where to start. The following five quick tutorials are to serve you as a guide through that functions and options jungle. Initially, I plan to do this in one tutorial, but that would be too long. Apart from that, you might only need help for a specific menu item, which is why I will do this in five separate videos for the menu items Camera Settings 1, Camera Settings 2, Network, Playback and Setup. I'm going to run through all the pages of these menu items individually with you, quickly explaining what function they have or can be invoked with and what options and settings they offer, which are most useful for hybrid shooters. So much detail already at this point of this series of tutorials might be inappropriate, but it's the fastest way of providing you with a sound overview of the camera's functions. This overview will also answer some immediate questions that might have emerged when going through the menu on your own. In summary, these five tutorials are your kickstart to the a7-3's functions and options. It will enable you to accomplish decent results with the a7-3 already at this point of this series of tutorials. All functions and options that we will touch upon in this video will be explained in much more detail and much more comprehensively on an individual basis in further tutorials. If you are not yet familiar with how to navigate this massive menu system, I would suggest you have a look at my tutorial number 4, where I explain its structure and how you can browse it the fast way. Just as a reminder for those ones who have already watched that tutorial, the icons for the respective menu item, the category headers and position indicators will facilitate orientation and will show you at any time where we are as we run through the pages. Okay, let's start with the camera settings. One menu item represented by the red camera one icon. There are 14 pages with each one offering up to six features, functions or submenus, mainly for settings relevant for still image mode. We start with page one where the category header says quality slash image size one. The first item is file format. If you use raw editing programs like Adobe Lightroom, DxO Photo Lab or Phase 1's Capture One, you should definitely choose raw to fully exploit the potential of the camera sensor. If you use the camera as a high quality point and shoot camera to quickly take your shot and upload it to social media with no time to edit it, you should select JPEG. However, there's also an argument to make for RAW and JPEG. If you are not on a budget and have enough storage capacity, simultaneously shooting RAW and JPEG might help to boost your creativity. For example, while one would typically convert a color photo into a black and white photo in post editing, with creative style set to black and white, simultaneously shooting RAW and JPEG is a good way to assess whether a subject looks good in black and white already when you shoot it. Later, in post-processing, you can then try to improve the black and white photo on the RAW file or if you have meanwhile come to the conclusion that you don't like it anymore, you erase the black and white JPEG and work on the colored RAW. Furthermore, different RAW editing programs interpret the data of a RAW file in different ways. You might realize that you prefer the interpretation of the camera's image processor that you find in the JPEG. Then you can keep the JPEG or try to mimic the JPEG by working on the RAW file and even improve on it. The next item on this page is RAW file type, which lets you choose between compressed and uncompressed RAW. Here you can save a lot of your storage capacity on your memory card and later on on your computer by selecting compressed. As you might remember from my last tutorial, the size of a compressed RAW is about 24 megabytes, but 48 megabytes for an uncompressed RAW file. While Sony cameras don't offer lossless RAW compression, you won't see any difference in quality between a compressed and an uncompressed RAW in probably more than 99% of all cases. And for that 1% or less, you really have to pixel peep to tell the difference. But if you have to pixel peep, the difference is not meaningful. So do yourself a favor and select compressed RAW and save 50% of your storage capacity. The next one on the page is JPEG quality. Here you should choose extra fine for the best quality. The next one on the list is JPEG image size. If you want to do prints from your files, 
I would go for large, which equals a resolution of 24 megapixels. If you know for sure at the time of shooting you will only publish your stills electronically, for example by uploading them to social media, medium or small should be sufficient, unless you want to crop them. The next one on the page is aspect ratio. You should choose 3 to 2 if you are a photographer. If you shoot stills only for integrating them into a video later on, an aspect ratio of 16 to 9 seems obvious. However, if you shoot raw, the file size of 3 to 2 and 16 to 9 is the same. Consequently, you wouldn't save storage capacity by choosing 16 to 9, but would have more cropping flexibility when choosing 3 to 2. In the described case, 16 to 9 only makes sense when shooting JPEG. Here the file size of photos with an aspect ratio of 16 to 9 is more than with 3 to 2. The last item on this page is APS-C slash super 35mm. Selecting it opens a menu with two submenus. If you own native E-mount lenses designed for APS-C sensors and switch frequently between them and native E-mount lenses designed for full-frame sensors, you should invoke Auto in the first submenu. Attaching an APS-C lens with its smaller image circle to a full-frame camera like the a7 III, a7 R3 or a9 would cause a whole lot of vignetting. With auto enabled, the camera recognizes when such a crop mode lens has been attached and automatically switches to using only the center of the sensor equivalent in size to an APS-C sensor. While the camera adjusts the live view image so that only the APS-C area of the sensor fills the monitor and viewfinder, you will get a lower resolution image. 18 megapixels instead of 42 megapixels for the a7 R3 and 10 megapixels instead of 24 megapixels for the a7 III and the a9. Having set APS-C Super 35mm shooting to auto when you are in movie mode, the camera does also switch to the crop mode automatically, but in this case this means an APS-C equivalent area of the sensor if an APS-C lens is attached to the camera, and to a Super 35mm equivalent area of the sensor if a full frame lens is attached. The Super 35 area is a little bigger than the APS-C area. However, in the latter case you would lose the 4K oversampling. This is one reason why you should set APS-C slash Super 35mm shooting to manual and APS-C Super 35mm shoot manual to off, if you only own native E-mount lenses designed for full frame sensors. The same holds true for still mode. You don't want to use only a portion of the sensor with your full frame lenses unless you want to virtually extend the focal length of your lens, maybe because it's not long enough to get a decent shot of a bird sitting high up in a tree. Let's switch to page 2 where the category header says quality slash image size 2 and which offers 4 items. The first item is long exposure NR. NR is the abbreviation for noise reduction. If set to on, the noise reduction kicks in on exposures taking longer than one second. If you shoot JPEG and don't want to do any post-processing, it makes sense having set this one to on. If you shoot RAW and don't try away from post-processing the or RAW editing programs and specific noise reduction tools that do a better job than the in-camera noise reduction. In this case you should set long exposure NR to off. You should also set it to off when shooting fireworks or a time lapse of a starry sky. The processing of the noise reduction takes roughly as long as the exposure itself and while this process is running your camera is locked up and you can't do anything until it's done. Meanwhile, you might miss the best burst of the firework. In a time lapse, for example with an exposure time of 20 seconds for each shot and an interval of 25 seconds between each shot, wouldn't be possible with long exposure and R enabled, as a noise reduction would take about 20 seconds, which would extend the intervals to at least 40 seconds. The next item on this page is high ISO NR. It allows you to specify the amount of in-camera noise reduction when shooting JPEGs at ISO 1600 or higher. If you want the best quality images at high ISOs, you should shoot RAW, where no noise reduction is applied, and do the noise reduction in post-editing with the right tool. If you shoot JPEG and don't do any post-editing, setting high ISO and R to low is a good compromise for getting some noise reduction, but don't lose too much detail in your image. 
The next item on the list is color space. If you want to print your images and have established a proper color management workflow with a hardware calibrated computer monitor and photo printer and assess the quality of your images under standardized light, then you should definitely invoke Adobe or Chibi. In all other cases, especially if you want to publish your images electronically, you should go for sRGB. The last item on this page is lens compensation. With this function, you can have your camera to digitally correct three types of common lens ailments. They are vignetting, what is called shading by Sony, chromatic aberration and distortion. The latter can be either pincushion or barrel distortion. My recommendation for lens compensation is auto on all three variables. Then the camera applies the corrections on all lenses it knows. However, the corrections are only applied to JPEGs with the one exception of shading, which is also applied to RAWs. Let's get to page 3 where the category header says shoot mode slash drive 1. The first item on this page you will find only in the A7 III and it's grayed out in all but one shooting and exposure modes. That one mode where it is not grayed out is the SCN mode, i.e. the scene mode that you can invoke with the mode dial on the top side of the camera. This turns the A7 III into a high quality point and shoot camera where you can choose either of seven automatic modes portrait, sports action, macro, landscape, sunset, night scene or night portrait. Here's no recommendation to make other than that you can invoke it in a faster way by rotating the front dial once the mode dial is set to SCN. The next one on the list is drive mode. Here again there is no recommendation to make as it depends on whether you want to shoot a single image or multiple images in a row or via self timer or use any of the bracketing modes. And here again you don't have to get into the menu system, you can invoke the respective mode faster by just pressing the left button on the control wheel. Next item is bracket settings, which opens a menu with two submenus. While putting your camera on a tripod is a must when doing bracketing work to avoid shaking, with self timer during bracketing set to two seconds or more, you even avoid shaking from pressing the shutter button. Alternatively, you can remote control your camera to avoid shaking. And in my view, setting the bracket order to minus, zero, plus, is the more logical order, especially when you do HDR bracketing where the camera will first shoot the underexposed, then the correctly exposed and finally the overexposed images. For the A7R3, the next item on this page is pixel shift multi-shooting. With this function enabled, the camera takes four images, each slightly offset from the previous, to get more detail in your still image. Use the left and right arrow buttons to choose how long it will pause between each shot. You should choose the lowest available. The prerequisite for the pixel shift multi-shooting feature is the avoidance of any shaking whatsoever. To do so, you need a rock steady tripod. Furthermore, you should either turn on the self timer or remote control the camera. And for maximum sharpness, switch to manual focus and use the focus magnifier that I will elaborate on later in this tutorial. To merge the four shots, you need Sony's imaging edge software. It cannot be done in camera. The next item on the page is MR camera one slash camera two recall. In the A7 III, this feature recalls one of six camera settings, which were stored to memory via the MR Camera 1 slash Camera 2 memory function before. In the A7 R3 and A9, you can recall seven camera settings with this function. The MR Camera 1 slash Camera 2 recall menu item is grayed out unless the exposure mode dial on the top side of the camera is set to position 1 or 2 with the A7 III, or 1, 2 or 3 with the A7 R3 and the A9. While you can address the memory positions 1, 2 and 3 directly with the exposure mode dial, the memory positions M1 to M4 can only be addressed by the pop-up window that opens when invoking memory position 1, 2 or 3. And while the camera settings assigned to position 1, 2 and 3 are stored in camera, the camera settings assigned to M1 to M4 are stored on one of the two memory cards in the memory card slots of the camera. If you format the respective memory card, they get lost. 
The next item on the list is MR Camera 1 slash Camera 2 Memory. It allows you to store all settings in the Camera 1 and Camera 2 menu items to 6 memory positions in the case of the A7 III and 7 memory positions in the case of the A7R 3 and A9 respectively. You can do so in any mode, no matter whether it's one of the still image or movie modes. Just open this function by selecting it with the center button, choose the memory position you want and confirm again by pressing the center button. To instantly recall one of the stored camera settings, just use the MR camera one slash camera two recall function I elaborated on a minute ago and choose the respective memory position. The last item on this page is select media. This function works in conjunction with the previous two functions, MR camera one slash camera two memory and MR camera one slash camera two recall. You will remember me mentioning that the memory positions M1 to M4 are stored on a memory card in one of the two memory card slots of the camera. With select media, you specify on which one they are supposed to be saved and in which one the camera is supposed to look for when recalling a memory bank. Let's switch to page 4, where the category header says shoot mode slash drive 2. This page contains only one item, which is the register custom shooting settings function. It provides a way to specify up to 10 shooting variables for instant recall via a custom button. While you can recall most of the camera 1 and 2 settings by using the MR camera 1 slash camera 2 recall function we just talked about, you can recall a subset of those after having specified them before by the register custom shooting settings function. You can store up to three collections of settings. The settings you can specify and recall later on or shoot mode P a, S or M, aperture if you are in A or M exposure mode, shutter speed if you are in S or M exposure mode, drive mode, exposure compensation, ISO, metering mode, focus mode, focus area, AF on. You don't have to specify all of them, you can also inactivate some of them. In order to quickly recall them later, you first have to assign the respective collection to a custom button. Let's get to page 5, where the category header says AF1. This page contains all features and functions for optimizing the autofocus to the current situation when in still image mode. This is an extensive topic which will be covered in future tutorials much more comprehensively and in much more detail. Here I just touch upon the most important points. The first item on this page is focus mode. It lets you choose between five focusing modes AFS, AFA, AFC, DMF and MF. AFS which is the abbreviation for single shot AF, focuses on a subject when pressing the shutter button halfway and then locks focus until you take the picture by pressing the shutter button through completely. AFC or continuous AF will continuously track and refocus if your subject or yourself is moving as long as you press the shutter button halfway. AFA or automatic AF lets the camera decide which one of the AF modes, AFS or AFC, is the right one for the situation you are confronted with in that very moment. DMF or direct manual focus will start out in AFS mode and when focused directly switch to manual focus mode where you can quickly tweak the focusing if you want. DMF can be very useful when you have MF assist, peaking level and peaking color enabled. MF or manual focus requires you to focus manually via the lens. If you combine it with MF assist enabled, you can better specify where to locate your depth of field and you will get a better accuracy than if you just relied on autofocus, which is especially helpful for macro photography or product shots in studio. If you want to be prepared for whatever subject crosses your way, then you should invoke AFC. The next item on this page is priority set in AFS. This feature offers three options. AF priority, which means the camera only takes a picture if it thinks the subject is in focus. Release, which means the camera takes a picture when you want it to do so. And balanced emphasis, where the camera tries to balance the first two options. You typically choose AFS as a focusing mode when you have the time to compose the picture and exactly determine the focus point. Hence, AF priority is the option you should go for. Next on the list, you find a related item, priority set in AFC. Here you have the same three options to choose from as with priority set in AFS. However, you typically choose AFC as a focusing mode when you absolutely want to get the shot, no matter whether your subject is absolutely sharp, because it's all about capturing the moment. Thus, 
release would be the right option. But if your subject is not moving too unpredictably, balance emphasis will yield better results. The next item on this page is focus area. It lets you decide which of six focusing areas to use. Two of these focusing areas offer further options, which takes a number of options to choose from to 14. And each one of them suits a certain situation. That's the reason why this one feature, focus area in and of itself, is such an extensive feature that we will have to cover it in detail in a separate tutorial. However, if you want to be prepared for whatever subject comes along, the option you should go for is wide when shooting AFS mode and lock on AF wide when shooting in AFC mode. Generally, the camera will focus on whatever is closest, which might not always be your intended subject. If you combine both wide or lock on AF wide with face detection enabled, the camera should successfully identify your intended subject in 99% of all cases if your subject is a person. The next item on the list, focus settings, is just another user interface for selecting focusing modes and involves the control wheel as well as the front and rear dial. To exploit its full functionality, it has to be assigned to a custom button first. The last item on this page is switch V slash H A F area. It lets you automatically switch focusing areas and AF points when rotating the camera body from horizontal to vertical position and vice versa. It's somewhat complicated in all its detail, which is why we have to cover this in a separate video. For the time being, you won't miss anything switching this to off. Let's get to page six now, where the category header says AF2. The first item on this page is AF Illuminator. I touched upon the functions of the AF Illuminator in tutorial number three. With this item in the menu, you can activate the AF Assist light, which enables the camera to focus even when it's completely dark. My recommendation is to set this to auto. Important to know, the AF Illuminator only works with a native E-mount lens attached to the camera, and it does not work if the camera is set to AFC, i.e. continuous AF. The next item on the page is Center Lock on AF. Besides the seven variations of the Lock on AF feature in still image mode, Center Lock on AF is the second autofocus feature that allows the camera to track a subject. While it doesn't do so as effectively as Lock on AF, Center Lock on AF also works in movie mode. For instant access, you should assign this feature to a button, for example, Center button. Then you invoke it by pressing the button and activate it by pressing the center button again. If you want to stop it, just press the center button a third time. Center lock on AF tracks high contrast subjects. Even better if those subjects have a distinct color that sets them apart from the background. If these criteria for a subject are not met, you are usually better off using the options the camera offers you for AFC focusing while in movie mode. The next feature on the list is Set Face Priority in AF. Selecting it opens the submenu with two items, Face Priority in AF and Face Detection Frame DSP. Setting the first one to on enables face detection. Setting the second one to on changes the color of the face detection square from green to white when a registered face is detected. My recommendation is on for both items. The next item on the page is AF Track Sensitivity. Context-wise, this should be part of page 5, where all the other autofocus features for still image mode can be found. When focus mode is set to AFC, the AF track sensitivity is used to tell the autofocus of the camera to either capture any subject that comes along quickly or stick to an already captured subject. We will cover this in much more detail in a future tutorial. For the time being, it's sufficient to know the following. Let's assume you want to take a picture of your son's first football match. While there are a lot of moving subjects, you want the autofocus to focus on your son and then stick to him like Louie. Then you have to set AF track sensitivity to 1. If you and your camera have to react quickly and it's all about getting at least one sharp shot, for example of a bird in a flock of birds taking off, the right setting is 5. And I usually keep this at 5. Next one is AF system. If you have attached an A-mount lens to your camera via an LAEA1 or LAEA3 adapter, the hybrid autofocus system of the camera does not work. This function lets you choose between face detect only or contrast detect only. I recommend to choose face detect because it's faster and works in AFC mode. The last item on this page is AF with shutter. 
The default setting is on, which makes the camera initiating autofocus when you press the shutter release button halfway. Setting it to off decouples the autofocus and shutter release function. In order to initiate autofocus, you first have to assign the autofocus function to a button. For example, the AF on button. Then you initiate autofocus and track a subject by pressing the EF on button and take the picture by pressing the shutter release button. This is called back button focus. I covered this topic in tutorial number three. Let's get to page seven where the category header says AF3. The first item on this page is pre-AF. Setting this to on enables the camera to start autofocusing even before you press the shutter release button halfway. It seems to work with native E-mount lenses only. While it consumes more power, it should help you missing less shots, which is the reason why you keep it on. The next feature on the page, iStart AF, only works when you have an A-mount lens attached to the camera via the LAEA2 or LAEA4 adapter. Then the camera starts autofocusing when you bring the viewfinder up to your eye, even before pressing the shutter release button halfway. As long as an E-mount lens is attached to the camera, this feature is grayed out. The next item on the list is AF Area Registration. It lets you register a focusing point and focus area anywhere in the frame and invoke it quickly by assigning it to a custom button. I have it set to off, but if you want to use this function, just set it to on and follow the instructions on the monitor. Choose your focus area and focus point and save it by pressing the FN button for three seconds. Then assign register AF area hold or toggle to a button to quickly invoke the safe focus area and point as soon as you need it. The next function, delayed registered AF area, lets you delay the just mentioned registered autofocus area and point. The next feature on this page is AF area auto clear. Setting this to on when in AFS focusing mode, you tell the camera to display the found focus point only for half a second. Setting this to off displays it for as long as the shutter release button is pressed halfway. Mine is set to off. The last item on this page is display continuous AF area. This one lets you see the individual face detect AF points at work when the camera's focusing mode is set to AFC. I keep this on as I want to see whether the AF is focusing on and tracking the intended subject. Important to know, this feature only works with the following focusing areas. White, zone and the seven lock on AF focusing areas. Let's switch to page 8 where the category header says AF4. The first item on this page for the A7 or 3 is face detect area. With this one set to on, you see a frame containing the sensor face detect AF points. Outside that frame, the camera will use contrast detect AF. Since it has no real function, I set mine to off. The first and only item on this page for the A7 III is AF micro adjust. With this feature, you can correct for focusing problems when using A-mount lenses attached to the camera via an LAEA2 or LAEA4 adapter. Let's get to page 9 where the category header says Exposure 1. The first item on this page is Exposure Compensation. Exposure Compensation is used to override a meter's recommendation, which means you can over or underexpose a shot with it. But why is there an exposure compensation feature in the menu system, although there is a dedicated exposure compensation dial right on top of the camera? This is a legitimate question. However, you know the answer if you have watched my tutorial number three. While you can overexpose a shot by up to plus three EV or underexpose it by down to minus three EV, with the exposure compensation dial, you can extend that to plus 5 EV and minus 5 EV respectively with the exposure compensation feature in the menu. However, this only works in still image mode. In movie mode, you can only overexpose by up to plus 2 EV and underexpose by down to minus 2 EV, no matter whether you do so by the exposure compensation feature in the menu or by the exposure compensation dial. Oh, by the way, if the exposure mode dial is set to anything other than zero, this feature is grayed out. The next feature, Reset EV Compensation, is related to the above. 
If you change exposure compensation via the menu, this feature lets you determine whether it is set to zero every time you turn the camera on or keep it where it was. I don't use the exposure compensation feature in the menu as it bears the risk that I forget about it, which subsequently might lead to confusion. However, if you use it, you should set it to reset. The next item on this page is ISO. I can see the advantage of accessing this feature via the menu. I always access it via the right button on the control wheel because it's faster. But it gives me the opportunity to talk about ISO more generally. As you know, ISO specifies how sensitive the camera is to light. The higher the ISO number, the more sensitive the camera is to light. However, the more sensitive the camera is to light, the more noise we get and the lower the dynamic range is in the image. That's the reason why in the past we chose the shutter speed and aperture according to the situation, then tried to get the shot done with an ISO value as low as possible, or we chose a low ISO value first and then adjusted exposure time and aperture accordingly. That now belongs to the past. The sensors of the A7 III, the A7 R3 and A9 allow for shooting auto ISO. Especially the A7 III offers very little noise and high dynamic range at higher ISOs. Up to ISO 3200, the dynamic range of the A7 III is still as high or higher than 12 EV with a maximum of 14.7 EV at ISO 100. And due to the dual gain architecture of its sensor, Dynamic range at ISO 800 is even higher than at ISO 320. This provides a lot of flexibility. Consequently, shooting auto ISO leaves you more time to set shutter speed and aperture and compose your picture as you don't have to worry about ISO anymore. Personally, I'm very intolerant to noise. Thus, I recommend an auto ISO range from 100 to 3200 for still image mode, which can be boosted to 6400 in movie mode. The next feature is related to the one we've just talked about. When in still image P or A mode and ISO set to auto, ISO auto minimum shutter speed specifies the slowest shutter speed the camera is allowed to go before increasing the ISO. My recommendation is to set this to standard. When set to standard, the slowest shutter speed equals 1 divided by the lens focal length. For example, if you have a 100mm lens attached to the camera, the minimum shutter speed is 100th of a second. Consequently, for longer focal length, you are usually on the safe side with the faster shutter speeds. Due to IBIS, the in-body image stabilization, you can safely handhold the camera with a 24mm wide-angle lens and a minimum shutter speed of 1 24th of a second, but that might not be fast enough for your subject. Hence, you should bump up the ISO auto minimum shutter speed to 1 125th of a second or faster. The next feature on the page is metering mode. The camera offers six metering options, which can't be adequately covered in this video. I will do an extra tutorial on this topic. For the time being, I recommend using multi-segment metering. For those ones amongst you coming from other brands, Nikon calls this matrix metering and I guess Canon calls it evaluative metering. Sony's multi-segment metering will get the exposure right in the vast majority of all cases. And even in those rare cases where multi-segment metering would get it wrong, thanks to live view on your monitor and EBF, you will rather adjust exposure using the exposure compensation dial than switching to another metering mode. The last item on this page is face priority in multi-segment metering. This tells the camera to bias the exposure toward a recognized face in face detection mode. You can safely keep this on. It's helpful when one or more faces are your subject and it doesn't kick in when no faces are detected by the autofocus. Let's switch to page 10 where the category header says exposure 2. First feature on this page is spot metering point. Covering all six metering options when elaborating on metering modes just a minute ago would have been beyond the scope of this tutorial. However, one of those other options is spot metering. When in spot metering mode, this feature lets you specify whether the spot metering circle is supposed to stay in the center or automatically relocate to where the focus point is. If you prefer the latter, which by the way would be logic, you have to set it to focus point link. The next item on this page is exposure step. It lets you determine whether each wheel click changes exposure by 0.5 or 0.3 stops when adjusting the exposure compensation with the exposure compensation dial. Now you might be thinking, why the heck should I care about whether it's 0.5 or 0.3? 
In fact, this has wider implications than you might think. Firstly, it dictates what shutter speeds you can select in shutter, priority and manual mode. Secondly, you might want to shoot cinematic videos. When we talk about cinematic videos, we are usually referring to a frame rate of 24 frames per second and a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second. This gives you that cinematic look. However, you might realize that the camera doesn't offer a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second, only 1 45th and 1 60th of a second, but nothing in between. If that's the case, the exposure step is set to 0.5. In order to get 1 50th of a second, you have to set your exposure step to 0.3. The next item on the list is AEL with shutter. It lets you specify whether you want to lock exposure when pressing the shutter release button halfway. While this makes sense in AFS mode, it doesn't in AFC mode. Hence, the right setting is auto. The last feature on this page is Exposure Standard Adjust. It allows you to bias the individual metering modes. I can't see any advantage in manipulating metering, which is why I don't even touch it. And let's get to page 11 where the category header says Flash. As the category header indicates, this page contains the camera's flash features of which the first one is Flash Mode. It offers six modes. Covering this now would be beyond the scope of this video, which is why I will dedicate an extra tutorial to this topic and restrict myself to only the most important points now. Especially with the A7 III and its awesome low light capabilities, you will realize over time that in many cases where you used a flash in the past, you get better results without and capture more of the original scene special atmosphere. In the other cases, fill flash is a pretty good option. However, quite frequently, when a scene is lit by warm light, a flash can destroy the atmosphere. In those cases, I would encourage you to also experiment with slow and rear sync. The next function, flash compensation, is related to the first one on this page. It's difficult to say whether it's due to the camera or the flash. Fact is that subjects are overexposed by about one stop with default settings when using a flash. This is why I keep it set to minus one most of the time. With the next item on the list, exposure compensation setting, you can specify whether you want the exposure compensation function to adjust for ambient light only or ambient and flash together. For you to understand this feature, you need to know that the camera offers two different kinds of exposure compensation. The first one is the exposure compensation, which can be invoked by the respective dial on top of the camera or in the menu. The second one is the flash compensation, which adjusts the flash intensity. If you want to control both simultaneously, you have to set exposure compensation to ambient and flash. I prefer ambient only and separately control my flash intensity using the flash exposure compensation function. Setting that one to minus one gives you a more natural look of your images when using the flash as a fill. The next feature is wireless flash. If an accessory flash is attached to your camera via its hot shoe, this controls whether it provides light for the picture or just sends control signals to an off-camera flash. You only have to set this to on when shooting wirelessly via a second flash. The last feature on this page is red eye reduction. I've always hated this feature because people get irritated by the strobe-like flashlights prior to the actual exposure, which destroys the moment you want to capture. Red eyes can occur in images if the flash is too close to the lens. However, the camera has no pop-up flash on the camera and a proper flash attached to the hot shoe is sufficiently far from the lens. Consequently, red eyes will never happen with this camera, which is why I strongly recommend keeping this off. Let's switch to page 12 where the category header says color slash white balance slash image processing. The first feature is white balance that I never access via the menu, but by a custom button to which I have assigned this function for immediate access when I need it. It lets you invoke one of 13 options for compensating for light that is not pure white. Many people tend to say, if you are a raw shooter, you just set this to AWB, which is automatic white balance. Then you don't have to care about the right white balance anymore as you can tweak it later on in your raw editing tool. In fact, this works in most cases, but not in all, which is why I always try to get it right in the field already via the offered options, which include custom white balance. I will do a separate tutorial just on the topic white balance. For the time being, you should get along quite well with AWB if you are a raw shooter. If you don't like raw editing and shoot JPEG, you definitely should make use of the white balance options the camera offers, including the custom white balance. 
Next feature, Priority Set in AWB, lets you tweak the standard behavior of the Auto White Balance. With Auto White Balance activated, setting this to white, subjects in your image will appear whiter. While technically correct, they might appear somewhat sterile. Setting it to ambient, you tweak this towards a warmer, more yellowish tone, which might be desirable when shooting under incandescent light. I keep mine set to standard. The next one, DRO slash Auto HDR, combines two features in one item. DRO stands for D Range Optimizer and HDR for High Dynamic Range. I'm a big fan, especially of the DRO feature. DRO in conjunction with the very high dynamic range of the A7 III, the A7R III and the A9 is a great combination, which provides new possibilities and can boost your creativity. Here again, this is an extensive topic beyond the scope of this tutorial, which is why I will dedicate a separate tutorial to it. For the time being, you have to know the following. DRO addresses a major issue in photography. The human eye can see a much wider dynamic range than the camera sensor. In situations with a relatively dark subject in front of a bright background, you will either manage to correctly expose the subject or the background, but not both. With the mentioned Sony cameras, you expose for the highlights in your picture. Without DRO, the details in the shadows in your picture would get lost. However, the very high dynamic range of these camera sensors allow for lightening up the shadows in camera with DRO without significantly increasing the noise in the shadows, at least if your base ISO is not excessively high. Setting DRO to auto, which is my default setting, is a good starting point. In extreme situations, the effect with auto is too little, which is why you can boost this up to level 5. Or, if you want to try a few variations, just use DRO bracketing that you can access via the drive mode button, which is the left one on the control wheel. In many cases, DRO will help you to capture an image of a scene pretty much as your eye saw it and with a more natural look than lightening up the shadows with a raw editing tool in post-processing. Quite frequently, I use DRO as an alternative to fill flash. Another positive of the DRO feature is that it even works in most movie modes. There is one caveat to DRO though. Its effect is not applied to RAWs, only to JPEGs. While you can invoke DRO when shooting RAW and while you see a thumbnail after taking the picture that shows its effect, as soon as you get back to your computer and look at the picture in your RAW editing tool, it looks completely different from what you saw on your camera's monitor. Consequently, you should either shoot JPEG or RAW and JPEG simultaneously to benefit from DRO. Shooting RAW and JPEG simultaneously, you can use the JPEG as a template and post-process the RAW until it looks like the JPEG or at least similar to it. If you are confronted with a situation that requires a high ISO in the first place, like for example city nightscapes, DRO might not be the best option. Lightening up shadows shot at very high ISOs might increase noise to an unacceptable level. With HDR, the other function of this feature, the camera offers another option that might be better in these situations. HDR can only be invoked when shooting JPEG. When activated, the camera will analyze the scene and then take three shots in rapid succession up to six stops apart. One image will be exposed for the highlights, one for the shadows, and one in between. Then the three images are merged and saved as a single JPEG file. That way you can virtually capture more dynamic range than what the sensor is capable of. What had to be done in the past in the cumbersome process of taking three or more pictures with your camera on the tripod and merging them with a special HDR tool or Photoshop's HDR feature is now done in a matter of a second by the camera with HDR activated. If you are now wondering why these out-of-camera HDR JPEGs don't pop as much as some of the surrealistic looking HDR images you have seen on Flickr or similar platforms, the explanation is that a second process has been applied to those, which is called tone mapping and is done on a computer. As a last word on HDR, similar to DRO, HDR offers several levels, six to be precise. I can't give any recommendation what level is right because it depends on the situation. The next item on this page is Creative Style, which is a collection of tweaks the camera applies to an image when activated. There are 13 of them, plus six slots where you manipulate those tweaks and can save your own settings, like contrast, saturation, and sharpness for each one of them. 
I prefer doing any image tweaking by computer with a raw editing tool, which is why I keep this set to standard. However, for shooting landscapes, I can recommend the landscape tweak, which yields pretty good results. And while I usually do black and white not in camera, but on computer from color raws, the black and white tweak in conjunction with the DRO feature discussed before can yield pretty interesting effects. What you should know if you want to experiment with creative style, although it can be invoked when shooting RAW, the settings are only applied to JPEGs. However, the settings are written to the EXIF data of RAW files. A new version of a RAW editing tool like Lightroom that supports the respective camera model can read them out and automatically tweak the RAW accordingly. But if you work with an outdated version of Lightroom that doesn't support the camera model and you have to convert the camera's RAWs into DNG files, for example by using Adobe's DNG converter, in order to subsequently process them in Lightroom, the settings might get lost and the tweaking does not get applied to the image. The next feature on the list is Picture Effect. This can only be invoked when shooting JPEG and turns your expensive camera in kind of a toy camera that produces cheaply looking pictures. Apart from the two black and white effects that produce acceptable results and might therefore be worth experimenting with them, the other effects probably only make sense if you quickly want to generate a somewhat unusual effect to upload to social media with no prior processing whatsoever. I keep this set to off. In contrast to the prior feature, the next one, Picture Profile, is a high quality feature. Simply said, it's the equivalent of creative style, but for video. Adding this feature, Sony has equipped the a7 III and the a7R III with some really professional filmmaking options like flat profiles and HDR profiles. However, this is a huge topic. I would have to elaborate on gamma curves, color modes, black level, knee, the specifics of f 2 and 3, as well as of hybrid lock gamma, and finally color grading. That would require several tutorials and therefore is way beyond the scope of this tutorial. I will do several tutorials explaining all of these. For now, I would recommend to keep this off. You will achieve decent results with your videos even without applying any picture profiles. And if you don't like what you get, try the City 4 profile which you should find in Picture Profile 6. Let's get to page 13 where the category header says Focus Assist. The first item on this page is Focus Magnifier. It's only available in Manual Focus or DMF, which is Direct Manual Focus Mode. It tells the camera to magnify the image at a specified point in the image so you can do critical manual focusing. This feature is pretty similar to MF Assist, another manual focusing feature I will be talking about in a minute. Focus Magnifier requires you to first activate it and then specify where you want to zoom in. While this is a slower process than with MF Assist, Focus Magnifier also works in movie mode, what MF Assist does not. If you press the center button while manually focusing, you can zoom in even more. The next item, Focus Magnification Time, is used to specify for how long you want the magnification in the Focus Magnifier and MF Assist feature to stay on. I have it at 5 seconds. 2 seconds would be too short and no limit would conflict with direct manual focus. With the next function, Initial Focus Magnification, you can determine with what magnification you want to start off when invoking Focus Magnifier or MF Assist. I set mine to 5.9 times. The next function, AF in Focus Magnification, allows you to autofocus while in Focus Magnifier or MF Assist mode. Isn't this a contradiction? Autofocusing while in Focus Magnifier or MF Assist mode, which only work in manual focus modes? No, not really. As you might remember, direct manual focus will start out in AFS mode and then switches to manual focus mode. Hence, you can initially autofocus in DMF mode while the part of interest of your image is magnified and then fine adjust your focusing manually. This is quite handy for macro photography, which is why I keep this on. Next function is MF Assist. Like Focus Magnifier, it's only available in manual focus and direct manual focus mode. Unlike Focus Magnifier, it does not work in movie mode. However, it's invoked quicker than Focus Magnifier. When set to on, it kicks in automatically and magnifies the live view image as soon as you turn the focus ring of the lens attached to your camera. And if touch operation is enabled, you can move your finger over the camera's monitor to navigate around the zoomed in area while you are focusing. 
MF Assist only works with native e-mount lenses. I keep it set to on. The last feature on this page is peaking setting. It's only available in manual focus and DMF mode and can be a very handy manual focusing aid. You set on all the areas that are in focus or lit up in live view. I keep this set to high and red. If you are focusing on a red subject, you have to switch the peaking color to yellow or white. If used while focus magnifier or MF assist is activated, it can be disturbing at the maximum magnification. Then just turn it off. Finally, let's switch to page 14, the last page of the camera one menu item where the category header says face detection shoot assist. The first function on this page is anti flicker shoot. Almost all light bulbs flicker, which means they are repeatedly and very rapidly switching from bright to dark and back again. This happens at frequency that are so fast that the human eye isn't able to dissolve it. Pressing the shutter release button, it takes a few milliseconds for data to be read out of the sensor. If this falls into that very short time when the light bulb goes from brightest to darkest, this can cause flicker in your image. The risk of this happening is high at indoor sporting events when shooting with high shutter speeds around one thousandth of a second. If the camera detects it, the flicker symbol appears on the monitor if the display all info is invoked on the monitor. In these cases, turn on anti-flicker shoot. The next feature is face registration. Selecting this in the menu opens a submenu by which you can tell your camera to give autofocus preference to the eight faces you can register with it. Wedding photographers will love this feature as they can register and prioritize bright and groom so that the camera focuses on them in a group shot. The last function on this page and also of the camera one menu item is registered faces priority. It is used in conjunction with the prior feature and enables or disables the ability for registered faces to take priority over other faces the autofocus finds. In my view, registering faces without prioritizing them makes not that much sense, which is why I keep this on. Now that you have gotten an overview of all the features, functions and settings of the camera settings one menu item, make sure you don't miss the next tutorial on the features, functions and settings of the camera two menu item. Just hit that subscribe button and the bell icon next to it and you will be notified. And if this tutorial was helpful for you, I'd be glad to get your thumbs up.